And we have a couple of uh, the staff members from WCAT doing the videoing tonight. I just want to make a few comments about what's been going on with uh, FOLQ the past year. We've been continuing to follow the CCNF development at the head of the lake. We attended many ZBA and planning board meetings. Uh, we collaborated with the town on the floral ray development. We um, also worked on a new mission statement and vision statement, which we approved in April, which appear now on our, our, um, on our new brochure, which I don't think we have here tonight. Thank you. Uh, I know. We forgot that. On the website, right. Um, we did, we have done the first of two lake cleanups. We did the one in April. The next one will come up in October. Uh, we filled a social media position and Anne-Marie over here is with us. And we're working on the updating the website and that's coming soon. Uh, last June, we at our annual meetings, just a year ago, we approved bylaw changes. We also then last summer um, per, did, participated in the festival by the lake, the farmer's market. Um, the landscape committee did an enormous amount of work installing plantings at Spalding Park. And that was Rob Wedick and Bill Conley and Bill Boudry. Yeah, they. And then just this spring, we put the, the planters in around the flagpole. There's, there's some new concrete planters, so we did that. Uh, <clears throat> we work at the Run for Ages, which is held in November around the lake, and that's we've been doing that for a couple of years now. We're kind of like the traffic people at the intersections. And at the annual breakfast last year, we gave the Spalding Award to Doug Heath and Allison Simcox, who are with us at this table over here. And I do have to mention that our longtime supporter, board member, former town selectman, Jim Scott, passed away in November, and we do still miss him. All right, so with that, we're going to go to the business. Um, a quorum, we do have a quorum, I believe, looking around. We have members and board members here. Uh, I need a motion to approve the 2022 minutes from someone on the board. So moved. Bill Boudry moved. Second. And Rob Reddick seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining. <laughs> we have a financial report which is available by requesting it at mail at folq.org. And our financial report is always done by our treasurer, Doug Mildrum. And now we have two votes we have to take. We have to vote our um, board of directors, uh, the ones that are continuing on with us, uh, Lee Isla Given, Karen Failer, Tom Stapleton, Tim Welch, and Rob Wedick, all for three-year terms. Can I have a motion? Okay, a second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? I should take nominations from the floor, shouldn't I? <laughs> I forgot that step. <laughs> okay, and then we have to vote the executive board. Um, I'm uh, being proposed as president, Margaret Copey, Bill Boudry as vice president, Doug Mildrum as treasurer, and Bill Conley as secretary. Can I have a motion for that? Okay, Carol Dennison, Tim, second. Do we have any nominations from the floor? <laughs> We're doing such a good job, I guess. So, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstaining? And that is that. So, with that point there, we are moving on to our evening's program, and I believe... Hey, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate um, all the teamwork that we've been having here. And, um, you know, I'm really happy to see the DPW, um, the counselors, um, Steve, uh, all the members of the Friends of Lake Kwanapawa and a lot of people that are very interested in our lake. And uh, a lot of these, uh, you know, that the town is getting together and they're putting surveys out and everybody says, why do you like Wakefield? And they say, it's the jewel of our town, it's Lake Kwanapawa. And uh, we're trying to do the best we can to make it really a great spot for everybody. And um, I've been working with Solitude. Brendan and I have connected, 
a year and a half ago. Uh, he's been very, and, and we brought Dominic in. They've been very helpful in uh, giving us direction and giving us some ideas. And we want to get those ideas out and, um, and see what, we, what can be done about it. And, and this is the momentum we're starting. It's, we've had starts and stops over the years. And uh, we'll, t we'll talk about a survey that was done recently, but then nothing happened. So we want to try to get things rolling. And um, maybe I'll just start. Um, and uh, let me introduce the two speakers tonight. Uh, Brendan is the business development consultant for all of New England for Solitude Lake Management. He grew up on the water fishing and boating on ponds and lakes throughout New England. He probably hasn't been on beautiful Lake Quantapowit yet. <laughs> no, but we did walk around it. These guys came out a month ago, and we took the beautiful walk around. Well, not so beautiful uh, for um, in the summer. It was a lot nicer now because we didn't see the algae. But we've seen pictures of it, and you'll see pictures of it tonight. But uh, they learned a lot about the lake, and uh, we learned a lot of ideas that we didn't really think about. So you know, a lot of this interaction is, is really helpful. Everybody gets more information that we're going to be able to clean this thing up. Um, so uh, Brendan graduated from High Point University, Bachelor's of Science in Business Administration. He's been with Solitude for just over three years, helping find solutions to restore water quality and balance for municipalities, towns, lake associations, private homes, owners, and uh, HOA associations. So thank you, Brendan. And, uh, and Dominic Maringolo. Uh, is an environmental engineer and project manager for the nutrient remediation with Solitude Lake Management. He's a regional leader for projects in central and northeast Massachusetts and northern Connecticut. The, he, he is responsible for leading the company's larger in-lake phosphorus management projects. To date, he's completed dozens of large lake alum treatments across New England, and he's been, has also implemented a wide variety of natural management techniques in hundreds of lakes and ponds uh, to improve their water quality. He earned his Master's of Science degree in Environmental Engineering from uh, Worcester Polytech Institute in 1998. And he began his career in lakes and pond management industry with aquatic control technology in 1995. So he's been around for a while in this business. And he was doing that while he was working on finishing up his master's degree. He's married, he's got four kids, and when they're not managing, when he's not managing lakes and ponds, the kids are on lakes and ponds, out in, uh, outdoors camping, fishing, and hiking. Um, so welcome both. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob, for the introduction. Nice to meet you all. Uh, I don't need to do an introduction for Dom and I since Rob took care of that. Um, just to give you a little background on Solitude, who we are, quick little background. Uh, we've been around for 50 plus years. Uh, we have treated and helped over 1,000 water bodies nationwide. Uh, we are a full service lake management company helping to educate and improve water quality around the country. Um, we're excited to be here tonight, help educate, inform, and uh, excited for a Q&A at the end. Before I jump into it, I want to go over an agenda tonight, give a quick background on what we're going to go over. So quick background on Lake Q, talk about cyanobacteria, phosphorus, nutrient remediation techniques, uh, some case studies, a report from the town, and then we'll sum it up with a little conclusion and then a Q&A at the end. So Lake Quinnipowit, uh, named after James Quinnipowit, a little different spelling, different little pronunciation, um, but he actually signed the deed over to Wakefield to the Europeans to allow for the town to come to be. Um, Lake Q is historically known for the salmon, uh, salmon fishing and alewife fishing, as well as their ice houses, um, and they used to ship their ice worldwide, which is kind of cool. Um, a fun fact, that ice may have ended up on the Titanic, um, whether that was in the captain's glass, that has not been disclosed. So, um, some more facts here that you can read, but Lake Hughes is roughly 250 acres. It's got a six foot average depth, and it's 11 feet at its deepest. Uh, unfortunately, you guys have suffered from a lot of cyanobacteria outbreaks over the last decade. 
Um, and you're also on the mass impaired waters list for non-native plants, uh, some DDT and fish tissue, and harmful algae blooms, again, with some turbidity issues. So I'm going to pass this off to Dom uh, to give a little more info here. Hey, good evening, folks. How's everybody doing? <clears throat> I was just telling Rob, I, I was, I, I came to a meeting in Wakefield about Lake Kwanapau, I think it was probably 15 or 18 years ago. I don't remember if it was the Friends or what exactly it was. It might have been the committee because it was at the town hall, but we were talking about many of the same options here. So I know you guys have been on a long journey with the lake and hopefully uh, there's some new energy in, in this um, effort now. So we're, we're happy to be part of that and happy to help. <clears throat> so as Brendan said, the, the lake suffers from harmful algae blooms. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that you have a high level of phosphorus in the water and in the sediment of the lake. So phosphorus, as many of you may know, is a, an essential nutrient. It's part of the way that uh, plants and animals use uh, to create energy. Um, and it's an essential nutrient, like many others, like nitrogen and other nutrients. Phosphorus is the one that's typically in the least amount of supply relating to some of the other nutrients. So the levels of phosphorus is what, what we call a limiting nutrient. So it actually has a very, very much related to how much algae can grow. The phosphorus, higher phosphorus means more algae. <clears throat> so the high cyanobacteria levels, I'm sure most of you probably know what cyanobacteria is, but it's a very basic form of algae. It's very often used to be, it used to be called blue-green algae, uh, but it's actually been classified as a type of bacteria that's been around for a long time. Um, it's actually probably helped um, create the oxygen environment that we have now. Uh, back when the seas were filled with cyanobacteria and as they photosynthesize they create oxygen. So um, that probably helped us be here today. But uh, when you have uh, certain conditions um, as such as high phosphorus, these algae, these cyanobacteria can grow out of control, grow in an overabundant manner. And one of the particularly bad things about cyanobacteria is one of their, their natural um, defense mechanisms is to actually form cyanotoxins. Um, so these toxins are what a lot of people talk about. You know, there's been, um, there's, there's a number of different toxins, a lot, there's, there's hundreds of, of different cyanobacteria species and every one of them uh, can form a multitude of different cyanotoxins, but they're all either neurotoxins, so nervous system problems, hepatoxins, liver problems, cytotoxins, and endotoxins. And there's been um, definitely documented cases of animal deaths, cattle deaths, dogs, um, all over the world. So this is not, this is not hype. I mean, there's, there's probably some hype out there, but this is a real situation, uh, and it's, it just obviously has effects on the, wa the wildlife and the fish in the pond and the lake as well as the users and re limits your recreation. So along with the high cyanobacteria levels uh, results in not only the cyanotoxins but obviously poor water qu clarity, the green color that the lake experiences, uh, low dissolved oxygen levels in the lake. Um, Bottom line is that you know the high phosphorus and the related effects of that have created poor ecological and recreational restriction conditions on the lake and could actually be harmful at times um, for fish and wildlife in the lake as well as pets and humans that use the lake for recreation or even for just uh, walking around. So there's been a, a fair amount of data collected on Lake Kwanapowit. Um, 1986, a diagnostic feasibility was, study was done by CDM. Uh, in 2000, a study was done by Enser uh, Corporation that basically reviewed um, the data from the CDM study, updated some of the data, created a lake model, kind of took it another step further. There's been various volunteer monitoring efforts as well. Uh, but you, you guys obviously know 
the lake is a very urban lake. It has 31 different storm drains going into the lake. So you have a, a lot of influence um, from urban runoff, stormwater, all the pollutants that go along with that. The ENSER study showed that the nutrients loading to the lake every year, 71% of that nutrient loading was from the watersheds, all the storm drains, and but 29% was actually coming from within the lake itself. So this is all of the pollution that's come into the lake and settled out on the bottom of the lake and is now kind of internally recycling during the summer periods. So at the point with these legacy nutrients is you have to have, kind of have a two-pronged approach. Um, and we'll get into that in just a second. So the internal loading is basically just a quick definition. It's just those phosphorus particularly, but also nitrogen and other things that have kind of collected in the lake, just kind of recycle and the during the summer period can come up and kind of help fuel some of these cyanobacteria growths. And this can, this can be from natural decomposition of the organic material in the bottom. It could also be different other types of chemical reactions, uh, particularly phosphorus when it settles down to the bottom of the lake has a tendency to bind with iron. Uh, the problem with that bi bi uh, bonding is that when the lake oxygen gets low at the bottom, the iron says, oh, see ya, let's go with the phosphorus. And that's then a lot can allow it to, to come back up into the water column. So that's what we call internal loading. <clears throat> So I'm sure everybody's pretty familiar with cyanobacteria, but how do, how do we manage it? And I found the two grossest pictures I could find on the internet for the presentation there. <laughs> and there's some other ones. But, um, so what do we do about cyanobacteria? So there's really two things that we can be reactive, which is, oh, we got an algae bloom, let's, let's try to get rid of it. And, uh, Folks have been doing that for probably 100 years, usually with copper-based algicides, copper sulfate, just killing the blooms when they form. You know, that's, that is a Band-Aid short-term solution, obviously. Uh, ideally, you want to have a proactive approach, so going back to that phosphorus being the controlling nutrient, limiting or reducing the amount of phosphorus that's coming into the lake and also the phosphorus that's already in the lake, trying to inactivate that is gonna lower your phosphorus concentrations and that is what's gonna prevent or reduce and hopefully prevent you from getting these cyanobacteria blooms. This is a picture that Rob sent me <laughs> from July 2020. Yeah, so when you have, you know, cyanobacteria is obviously green, so you see some of that blue and white stuff, that's, the, the scum is so thick that it's getting, it's, the sun's killing it and it's turning it black, green, purple, so that's actually dead cyanobacteria just because that layer is so thick. And obviously, you know, the, these scums can form when the, Algae populations are really high. They can blow around, build up in different parts of the lake. We did, when we did a site walk back on uh, April 24th, we did take a quick water sample for our biologists to look at in, on, in our office. We, at that time, didn't find a lot of cyanobacteria, although we heard recently that the counts are already climbing. This is just, this is what we actually found. This was a green algae. Just a reminder, there are good types of algae. Cyanobacteria, not so good, but you know, green algae, brown algae, golden algae, diatoms, they're all an excellent part of the food chain. So we're not looking to um, reduce or kill or kind of prevent all algae from growing. It's just a harmful cyanobacteria. So uh, yeah, how do we manage the, the phosphorus? Um, so there's really two two pronged approach. As I said, you have 71% of your phosphorus is coming from the watershed, the storm drains. So we need to look at watershed management. And, and there's been a lot done on that already, and there's more to come, I understand. Um, and that's really important for the long-term health of the lake. So you just want to reduce and, mit or, and or mitigate how much phosphorus is coming in through um, you know, zoning laws, source control, but also stormwater treatment. 
uh, retention basins, um, retrofits of the catch basin, stuff like that to try to capture as much phosphorus as we can before it gets into the lake. In terms of the in-lake management, which is what we're going to focus on today, uh, we really have three options that we're going to talk about. And these are the three main options. Um, first being aeration, circulation, or oxygenation, uh, dredging, and then we'll talk about inactivation treatments with uh, compounds like alum. So I'm actually going to turn it over, back over to Brennan. He's going to brief you guys on some of the aerator. Awesome. <clears throat> it's a little jar of alum, if anyone was wondering. So what is aeration, circulation, oxygenation? Uh, aeration is that mechanical, the movement of the water. Um, I'm also going to go through a couple slides to show you the differences between the few. Um, but aeration is circulation of oxygen. Um, it's a tool to help manage uh, cyanobacteria by increasing oxygen, um, as well as disrupting the algae growth. Uh, increased oxygen levels help prevent internal loading uh, of phosphorus in the lake. Um, and again, just that circulation, introduction of oxygen, it's going to reduce that chance of cyanobacteria from outbreaking. So this is a traditional or submersed aeration. So on the left, that's really a floating fountain. Don't read into that too much. Um, but what we're trying to key in on is the submersed aeration. So if you look to the picture on the right, you've got a small cabinet off onto the lawn or the edge of the pond. That's a small air compressor. Um, it runs air down that black hose to what we call a diffuser. Uh, so that is two large dinner plates, yay big, uh, with a rubber membrane on it. Ideally, it's to create small bubbles. And with the air movement up, the water comes with it. So we're going to get a churning effect of the water with the air. Uh, you do get some oxygen uh, diffusion between the air bubbles and the water. Uh, but not as much as the next couple of things we're going to look at. So diffused oxygen, this is a similar system where you have a device on the side. Instead of an air compressor, it's going to be a oxygen tank. Um, if you look at this black pipe running along the screen, there's a couple flotation devices attached to it, some anchors. Um, ideally, this is put in the middle of the pond. Oxygen is ran from that tank through this tube and it diffuses, similar to that membrane, small little oxygen uh, slowly into the water column. It's to stop that anoxic condition where that cyanobacteria is going to outbreak and take. Uh, so by having oxygen in the pond, it's, it should reduce any cyano outbreaks. Uh, the next is nanobubbles, again, another oxygenation product. Um, again, you've got a green cabinet on the lawn in the bottom corner to the left. Uh, that is the unit that actually injects pure oxygen into the water. Uh, the way this system operates is it has two, an intake and an outtake. The intake pulls in pond water. The system actually injects oxygen directly into the water uh, and then pushes it back out. Now, there's no oxygen, uh, excuse me, oxygen tank needed on this. Uh, it actually pulls it from the atmosphere. So there's a device in there taking pure oxygen out of the atmosphere, injecting it in the water, and pushing it back into the pond. Again, this isn't uh, so much directed at a certain layer. It's just pumping as much as it can, and it runs 24-7. OST, another oxygenation technology. I'm sure you're tired of me talking about these. A similar system to the last two, um, but this one monitors itself. So you see this big device down below on the bottom. Uh, there's a small pipe. That's where that diffusion between the oxygen and the water is going to happen. Um, but it can monitor itself. So we set a certain level of oxygen that we believe will stop cyanobacteria outbreaks um, or anoxic conditions. And again, on the shore, a pump that's taking oxygen out of the atmosphere, pumping it down in, and leaving the levels constant. Uh, the one plus to this technology versus the other two, um, it shuts off when it's done. So you do get some electricity savings from it. Um, <clears throat> The next is the Solar Bee, which I'm sure you guys are all aware of. Uh, you guys reviewed it in 2016. I'm not going to be the bad guy. I'm going to let Dom take this one to explain uh, about the Solar Bee. Yeah, so I know, I know you folks had some dealings with Solar Bee or years ago. Um, Solar Bee, 
don't hear about them as much as we used to. Uh, I'm sure they've probably had some successes here and there, but it turns out that it's not really been a very consistent um, approach. So what, what we're doing, what the solar bee does is circulates, all it's doing is circulating the water. So one of their, one of the big claims is that cyanobacteria like to be able to rise up and down in the water column. They, they like, they don't like, they like stagnant water. So the, one of the buy-ins with solar bee was that it just keeps the water moving. So it prevents, it stops the algae from being able to control buoyancy, go up and down when it wants to. It, it stops it from, stop the, the water from becoming stagnant. Uh, one of the issues that you have with the solar bees, and you know, your lake is very, very shallow. So, um, so what the what these machines do is they create a current, and they, you know, it comes up through there, and it's like a convection current. Uh, the problem is you know, that type of a system works better if you have deep water because it can create a larger convection current. But where you have a shallow lake, you need more of these units for them to work properly. And again, all you're doing is removing or moving the water around. You're not adding oxygen um, you're, and you're not really addressing the phosphorus or the root cause of the algae. Just a little bit on the um, aeration and oxygen design. So again, um, we talked about internal loading a little bit. Um, so, you know, the phosphorus can be coming internal. It can be internally loading from the sediments by just normal decomposition, so that is requires oxygen. So uh, aeration is not going to stop that particular me uh, mechanism from happening. If you have the iron-bound phosphorus, which we don't know because the sediments never really been tested on Lake Quanapau, and that is one of the recommendations, as we'll talk about later, is to get the sediment tested. Um, Iron-bound phosphorus um, is only releases under anoxic conditions, so aeration could potentially help with that with that type of a system. But again, the circulation systems are designed by trying to move the whole volume of the lake over a certain period of time. Uh, again, it relies on uh, oxygen input just from the atmosphere. You need more units for shallow lakes, and it just may not work. You may not provide enough oxygen by just moving the water, may not get down to the bottom and really prevent the bottom layer from going anoxic. We're talking about oxygenation systems, like Brennan was talking about, the, di the direct oxygen supply to the lake. We have a tank of oxygen and you're bubbling pure oxygen into the bottom of the lake. Um, those are typically, and the nanobubblers and the OST, they're typically designed to provide a certain num amount of oxygen to the lake over a certain period of time. And that's based on uh, testing of the lake to see how much oxygen demand is there from the sediments. And that's typically how those systems are designed. All of these systems do require, you're not really addressing the phosphorus directly, you're preventing it <laughs> from either preventing the algae from forming or present preventing the phosphorus from being released from the sediment. So you're not, the system stops working, everything starts coming back out again. The, so these systems typically require a pretty high significant, a pretty high capital and operating costs, especially um, as you probably know from getting some prices from solar bees, but all of the, all of these systems do have a pretty high capital cost and operating cost. They are prone to breaking down, so they need to be maintained. Do you want to do this? Yeah, I can talk about yeah. dredging. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of dredging, mechanically or hydraulically, hydraulically removing sediment. Uh, so your mechanical dredging, which you see here to the left, you drain down Lake Quinnipowit, put heavy equipment in. Uh, it's not the cleanest operation, but try to remove all that sediment uh, that's locked in phosphorus. Uh, you gain back depth, you remove nutrients, and it's like pressing a reset button on the pond very, very expensive. Uh, and then you've also have the hydraulic side of things. Um, hydraulic dredging, you've got this big auger on a suction vac. They leave the water in the pond so you don't have to drain it, but they go around the inlets and throughout the whole pond and pretty much pump out all the sediment into big geotextile bags. 
these bags will sit on site for a couple of months, dewater. From there, you dispose of the material. So dredging, uh, I like to say there's no replacement to dredging, uh, but it's a, a long compli or I shouldn't say that. Uh, it uh, takes a, a pretty big capital investment to get started, uh, but the benefits are very great. Dom, if you want to jump in about some phosphorus innovation technologies. Yeah, just uh, back to dredging for one second. I know um, we'll talk about, we'll present the survey that was done in 2016. I know a lot of folks were interested. It didn't seem like anybody was interested in dredging the whole lake, uh, but there was some interest in doing spot, spot dredging. So um, that's probably, I mean, it, again, we, we need to get more information about the sediment, um, but you know, dredging is not gonna stop your watershed load. You know, only removing part of it potentially is not going to remove enough phosphorus from the sediments to really make a improvement. I mean, obviously the, the dredging will help to deepen some of the areas of the lake, which can be a benefit in and of itself too. So in terms of, uh, so now we're gonna just go into the phosphorus uh, inactivation technologies. Um, so again, um, typically people look at phosphorus inactivation when they're, uh, internal loading is a significant part of the annual loading. Uh, also, if they're working on watershed, um, like watershed techniques, watershed management, but it's taking, you know, it's obviously that kind of stuff usually is expensive, takes a long time to kind of get implemented. A lot of times the best kind of reduction in phosphorus you can hope for with watershed management is about 50%. That's in, in the best case scenario. So alum, you know, has been used um, to, to inactivate phosphorus uh, in lakes and ponds. It's, uh, al alum is aluminum sulfate. Uh, it's a very commonly used uh, product in the drinking water treatment, wastewater treatment industry. Um, so it actually chemically uh, binds with phosphorus in a, in a permanent fashion, settles it down to the bottom of the lake. Uh, and also the, the um, unused alum that settles down to the bottom of the lake will actually absorb and inactivate the phosphorus that's in the sediment or anything that gets uh, decomposed and released it will be caught by the alum on the bottom. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Again, this is not a registered herbicide or, or algicide. It is a, a coagulant and a precipitant that, again, is used very commonly in the industry, industrial water cleanup. Drink your, more, more than likely your drinking water, um, maybe not here in Wakefield, but a lot of folks, um, I believe you're on MWRA water. Yeah, so that they don't, they're one of the few systems in the United States that don't have to treat their drinking water. Um, but many towns, many, many towns do use alum in their drinking water treatment plants. And it's been used since the 1980s. Uh, the, really, the frequency of alum treatments really picked up in the late 1990s and has kind of been picking up every year since. But it's a pretty well-proven technique. It's been done you know, thousands of times in the United States and, and other parts of the world. So it does have a, a long history of success. And we'll talk about some of the case studies also. This, this slide might be a little bit technical, <laughs> so hopefully we don't, don't lose any of you folks, but the idea is um, you want to put enough aluminum in the water with alum to bind up how much phosphorus you have in the lake. So we, you, have to do, you have to do some sediment testing to see how much is in the sediment. You have some information about what's coming in from the watershed. You calculate your kilograms per phosphor of phosphorus that's coming into the lake every year and you dose uh, the amount of alum that you need based on that amount of phosphorus. So you can also do uh, lower dose or higher dose treatments. Um, so low dose treatments are designed just to strip the phosphorus based on the amount of phosphorus that's in the water. And the higher dose treatments are the phosphorus that's in the water and the phosphorus that's in the sediments. Hey, Tom, can you do that next oh yeah, sure. Sorry. Is that better? Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, 
again, a, a lake like Lake Quanapawit that has both uh, in external loading from the watershed and internal loading, you may need to possibly do a combination of both while your watershed management techniques are becoming uh, coming to fruition. Uh, alum is does reduce the alum increases the acidity of the water so alum alumin, alum actually reacts with the water and creates a, creates a more lowers the pH makes it more acidic so on, in many cases we have to use a buffer compound along with the alum that would be typically sodium aluminate which has the benefit of also um, providing aluminum and providing contributing to the dose as well as balancing out the pH these are some uh, pictures of some alum treatments. Um, so you can see on, on the top left there, typically we're talking about tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of gallons of material that goes in the water. So you know, Solitude owns several barges with tanks on them that's used to distribute the alum. Um, and it's done in a very scientific manner with uh, flow meters, GPS guidance, um, and it typically takes um, a many, it takes, a, you know, in some cases a few days up to a couple weeks. It really depends on the dose. You can see on the lower left there is a, a trail behind the barge. So that is the alum that's behind the barge there. So it, what happens when it enters in the water is it creates a white, snowflake uh, precipitate, which we call a flock, and you can see that on the pictures on the right. So the, it literally creates a white snowflake-like flock that settles down through the water, stripping phosphorus, and then it settles down onto the sediment. As you can see in the bottom picture, that's a, a picture of the bottom of a lake that was treated. And that that will incorporate into the sediment over a period of days. In about a week after the treatment, it would not look any different than it did before the treatment. But all that alum that absorbs into the sediment uh, absorbs the phosphorus and also stays there as like a sponge to absorb any uh, phosphorus that gets released um, over the course of many years. I have a couple uh, case studies for you. Um, so this is an example of a pond, East Pond in Smithfield, Oakdale, Maine, where we did, uh, this is a 1720 acre lake. Uh, the funding was provided through private means as well as uh, grant funding from the state of Maine. We actually, tr on this particular one, we treated 676 acres out of that 1720 acre lake. <clears throat> and that was the area of the lake that actually was deep enough to go anoxic during the summer period. So we were looking really there for the high dose treatment to inactivate the sediments. Uh, the dose uh, we used there was expressed in 45 grams per square meter of the bottom. So 45 grams of aluminum per square meter. That was all determined through a lot of water and sediment testing before the treatment occurred. The treatment involved uh, applying 240,000 gallons of alum and, 12, and 120,000 gallons of the sodium aluminate. Again, both products contribute aluminum to the treatment. Alum brings the pH down, sodium aluminate brings the pH up. So in the proper ratio, it, it is able to maintain a stable pH throughout the whole treatment process. Another uh, another example, uh, and this, this uh, was a Tickle Naked Pond in Rygate, Vermont. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, we had, yeah, there was a lot of jokes flying around the office the, the year that we did this treatment. Um, but this was a, an interesting one. The, the Vermont DEC had established a TMDL. They had done a lot of watershed uh, work. They really now were like, okay, now we really got to address this internal loading of phosphorus, and this is kind of the last step in their process. So this particular project was done in 2011 to 54 acres of this lake. I'm sorry, 54 acre lake. We did 24 acre treatment, and the dose ranged from 60 to 105 grams of aluminum per square meter. And again, that was all based on sediment testing of the lake and we actually found variations in phosphorus different sections of the lake so we did different doses in different sections 
Uh, the interesting, one of the interesting things about this one, uh, we, we got there, there was already a cyanobacteria bloom ongoing, um, so we had to kind of uh, change the project parameters for the first few days to, for it to work properly. Um, algae blooms can cause a rise in pH naturally, uh, so that we had to, use, we basically used alum only for a couple days until the pH came back down to a normal level, and then we went with the combination treatment. <clears throat> uh, there's just uh, some ponds here that I list. So the ones on the left, White Island Pond in Plymouth, Montponset Pond in Halifax, Massachusetts, and Lake Attitash in Amesbury, were actually done using 319 funding provided by the state, which was a 50% match with funding from the town as well, but the state also provided significant funding to do these treatments. They all had a TMDL. They were all done with the um, cooperation of MassDEP. And I believe all of them, I know White Island Pond and Montponset Pond, I, I believe Lake Attitash as well, the, the treatments were successful in meeting the TMD, TM, TMDL goals uh, for that lake. And on the right there is just a list of some of the recent alum treatments we've done. We've done them in Rhode Island, New Hampshire, um, all through Massachusetts, Maine. Um, we Recently, Solitude recently acquired HAB Aquatic Solutions in January of last year, which was a, another alum treatment company that handled many other parts uh, where Solitude was based, alum treatments mostly in the Northeast. HAB Aquatics was uh, another company that had, did these alum treatments as well throughout all other parts of the state. So we now have a group together of, of um, experts in the alum treatments and with a long extensive history of successes and uh, specialized equipment to do all to do all this work properly remember now <laughs> so again, as I mentioned earlier um, the town or the Lake Kwanapawa Committee issued a report in 2016 uh, reviewing some of the some of the things that we've talked about today, like aeration, alum, and dredging. Um, as Rob said, nothing much came out <laughs> of that of that report. Unfortunately, one of one of the important one of the good things I think that was done was the survey. So we kind of got a feel the the, the committee kind of got a feel from residents on what. Uh, they would be interested in seeing done. I'm sorry. I think that was committee members. This is just okay. So this is the committee members. I'm sorry, that kind of had a, a selection of different techniques that could be used. So aeration. Uh, so these are the three big winners: aeration, alum, and spot dredging. Um, so we we've talked about all those. Uh, but as as we said, the committee was dismissed, and nothing's really happened uh, since that time. So. So po possible next steps, um, we have, this is an example, uh, so Lake, Lake Attitash is one of the examples that I gave, Rob actually had a conversation with the client up there, the, the uh, Lake Attitash Association. Uh, this was uh, just an example, so they, um, the cost of the alum treatment for Lake Attitash was $587,000, they received $352,000 from the EPA through the 319 um, Clean Water Act grant funding. Uh, and the city of Amesbury and other project partners uh, pitched in the other $235,000. So uh, in my experience, both DEP uh, has been pretty, f when, when the, all the data is collected and all the proper uh, assessments have been done, um, DEP has, has approved funding for many of these alum treatments, uh, so it's definitely a, a, a good avenue that you folks could potentially look at for, for doing, uh, doing some work on the lake. So just summary of our recommendations, I mean, obviously continue to pursue the watershed management actions. I mean, again, you have 71% of your phosphorus still coming in from the watershed, so we're trying to reduce that 
through what uh, through watershed management techniques is just very important for the long-term health. Um, I, we we would recommend kind of looking a little more into the alum treatment, and what really would be required with that would be what we call an alum treatment feasibility study. So I know you guys have, I mean, there's been lots of data collected on the lake. Certainly you don't need to do a whole nother uh, assess, full, full blown assessment of the lake, but I think uh, a feasibility study, collecting some focused water quality data, but especially sediment phosphorus information, I think is really gonna be important um, to see what types of phosphorus are in their sediment. Is it organic phosphorus that's getting released when conditions um, are well mixed? Is it iron bound phosphorus that's getting released only when the bottom goes anoxic? And also just how much phosphorus is down there. And the lake uh, model, uh, what NSER put together in, in 2000, their report, it, that, that model is really useful um, to not only see what's going on in your lake, but also to run predictions. So uh, if we could update that model to the current day with some a little bit of additional information on water quality and the sediment phosphorus, we can, you can start running scenarios if we reduced phosphorus 25% from the watershed and we did an alum treatment, what is the lake gonna look like? How, how uh, likely are we to have cyanobacteria blooms? And you can just run all sorts of scenarios with that. Uh, and then obviously once we have all, all the ducks in a row, um, you know, I think really making a decision on what, what management techniques, in lake management techniques that we'd wanna pursue. So, we'd be happy to answer any questions or if you need more detail on uh, anything that we talked about. Yeah, you had your hand up first, sir. Okay. Uh, so, if you apply alum, I guess uh, a heavy dose, how long would it expect to last? So, so um, the, 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 set of, the collection of sediment data and the model will help us determine how long it potentially would last. Um, lakes where you have a higher percentage of internal loading. So you're a 71 watershed, 29 internal. If it was more like 50-50, um, uh, we've had some lakes, uh, Lake, um, Lake Maury up in Vermont was treated in the late 80s and has over 20 years, almost 30 years of good conditions. The, the, the situation in Lake Kwanapawa is, you know, I know you guys are working on your watershed and you're doing that stuff, but, you know, that, that stuff takes time. Uh, it, it, it's never going to get your external load to zero. Um, so, yes, so this may not, this is, without, we'd have to do the feasibility study to get real numbers for you, but, Chances are, no, you're, not gonna, you're probably not going to get 20 years out of an alum treatment, or you may have to do a high-dose alum treatment to take care of what's in the lake and then have to do a periodic low-dose treatment to periodically address what's been coming in from the watershed. Yeah. Yes, sir. You use the Aditash Lake up at Avery as an example. First, what was the profile of the lake in terms of phosphorus? Was it 50-50? Was it 50 -50? Was it Um, I don't have all those numbers off the top of my head, but I, it's, it's actually probably a similar size lake to you, uh, to Kwanapowit. I believe it's in that two. 360. Uh, 360? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, There's actually an APA article uh, that uh, discusses that. I Good. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I don't know off the top of my head if, if it was um, how much what the split was between external and internal on that one. But that was, um, we still do some weed management out on that lake, and uh, so we keep in touch with the, the lake. It's, I mean, it's, it, hasn't, it's, it hasn't been that long yet, but I mean, they sti they're still experiencing good conditions there. So I think you had your hand up there, sir. So I'll um, get back to you, sir. You said this is hundreds of thousands of gallons of product. Where does the alum product come from? Good question. Yeah, uh, so again, it, really the gallonage really depends on two things, your dose and your air treatment area. So uh, we, we receive most of our product in the New England area from a Holland company in North Adams, Mass. So th those folks make alum. Uh, they make hundreds of thousands of gallons of alum. They supply m most or all of the water and wastewater treatment plants in, in New England. What is that process for making the alum? We're not getting too much into weeds. <laughs> so the, the product, the product comes to the lake in tanker trailers. It's a liquid uh, product. It's 4.4% aluminum, and it's in a solution. So we every everything we handle is liquid until the alum actually gets applied to the lake. Once it the alum gets applied to the lake, that's when it forms that white snowflake flock that settles down. It goes in as a liquid. Goes in as a liquid. Yep. Uh, I'm getting, I think, did you, oh, yeah. In terms of the, uh, uh, in terms of the propensity to uh, get this uh, uh, cyanobacteria outbreak, what would you consider to be a sort of tolerable level or a safe level of phosphorus? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, generally in the, in the lake management industry, uh, we like to see your phosphorus levels below 20 parts per billion or 0.02 milligrams per liter. Um, so most people say 0.20 or maybe 30 is probably okay too. <laughs> I think, uh, I don't, does anybody know off the top of their head what the phosphorus levels have been ra ranging in the lake recently? Okay. A lot of it's an interesting fact about cyanobacteria. I, I mentioned earlier how they like to rise and fall in the water column by themselves. So what they what they like to do is uh, they'll settle down to the bottom, absorb a bunch of phosphorus that's coming out of the sediment, and then they'll become buoyant, rise up to the surface of the lake, get all the sunlight, and start reproducing. So a lot of times, uh, phosphorus can be um, an order of magnitude higher right at that sediment water interface there. So, um, you know, the in water phosphorus doesn't always tell the entire story there. Uh, yes? Um, the concern in the, the idea of dredging, mm -hmm. uh, there is a, quite a bit of arsenic in the sediment in the lake from past treatments of weed, weed control, and that's a county so it doesn't break down. That, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so there's a, f a, a lot of permitting that goes into doing a dredging project. So you, have to, you have to get a permit from your conservation commission. You'll have to get a permit from Mass DEP um, called the 401 Water Quality Certification, where you'll have to do all kinds of sediment testing. They will tell you um, what your dredge spoils will have, to, what, how they can be disposed of, and the fact that you have arsenic and the sediments is going that so you're right that'll have to be treated as a hazardous waste so that disposing of that material would be extremely expensive to do a comparison of price so WPI they have a pond right outside covering water chestnut we're currently treating uh, we looked at the price dredge about eight acres um, and it was about four to five mil so <laughs> Lake Hue ars <coughs> and it's arsenic as well so it's just the disposal is what's going to get you. Well, when there was some dredging done, um, some people may, may remember it in yeah. Hawthorne Cove because of coal tar that was um, put into the lake from the, the old coal gasification plant that used to be where the gas used to come right from. It was, uh, but that was quite expensive. It was fortunately got a grant just to get it done, but it did exactly the process that you were talking about, putting it into those uh, plastic bags. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna go on this side. Yes, sir. You may have uh, you touched on this earlier, but you, you've um, done outreach business with a number of banks, and just wondering if the 29 percent regional loan replacement salary is being typical or average in terms of what banks do. So um, usually. If you're over 25%, you almost definitely have to address internal loading. I mean, we've had we probably have had some lakes that were, and again, that 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 balance can shift as you're doing watershed work over the years. You're going to reduce that, so those percentages may change. Um, one one of the things that the model will help us show is. Again, if we do an alum treatment, completely shut off the internal loading, is the external loading still enough to give you guys fairly frequent cyanobacteria blooms? And you know that's that's why you want to you kind of want to understand the whole picture. Yeah. Sure. Oh. So no, no, not necessarily. The uh, again, the alum treatments we've probably done 50 or more in Massachusetts alone. So I mean, it's a pretty well understood um, process, and the regulators are comfortable with it. You, you folks don't have like, do you have an, an, you don't have any endangered species in the lake, do you? Or just the humans? <laughs> <laughs> No, so I mean, at alum treatments, when done properly, will not have any adverse effects on fish or wildlife. Um, we've done alum treatments uh, in lakes with endangered mussel species um, and been allowed to do that. We've had to do a lot of monitoring, and that's shown no to, to have no effect. So um, the great thing about alum so aluminum is fairly common, and it's one of the most, I think it's the second or third most common element in the Earth's crust. So it's not, it's, it's a pretty abundant element in the, in, on the Earth. So, and the alum um, very quickly settles out of the water and settles down into the bottom of the lake and, like I said, incorporates kind of into that sediment layer. So you, and it's all in kind of a bound, non-bioavailable uh, form. So it really has, as long as you're done doing the treatment properly, maintaining a stable pH, there's, there's no problem with any of the treatments. You can also pick it up on your grocery <laughs> aisle in the McCormick section. So alum, uh, it's used for pickling. So if we're pickling with it, can we put yeah. it in the lake? Uh, we're running up on time, I think. What do we got, one or two yeah, more one, questions? One question. One question. How about Bill Connolly, pres former president of yeah. Friends Lake? <laughs> yeah. uh, so, alum treatment on wind and water and shallow lakes. So, the wind and water wave action, uh, and we're very, very shallow. Uh, so, any uh, experience with that? Or? Yeah, uh, actually, the, the White Island Pond treatment that we uh, I had mentioned was a f very similar lake. I, it might have, I think the, the max depth in that lake was, I want to say it was. 15 or 18 feet, but it's still relatively shallow. Um, we have done um, we have done shallow lakes. So what happens is the aluminum um, the aluminum forms a permanent bond. So it, you know, just like any other lake sediment, if it gets stirred up during a wind event, it settles back down on the bottom. So the flock and the aluminum bound phosphorus you know, may get kicked up just like any other sediment, but just settles back down and doesn't release, the aluminum doesn't release the phosphorus, so it stays in a f stable form and just settles back down. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. It's, uh, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for coming, and there's an awful lot of good information here. Uh, hopefully we can get this kick started. I think a lot of people in this room uh, have the capacity to get involved, 
and uh, we love to have more people involved with the Friends of Lake Quantum Powell. Our Water Quality Committee has just brought on two new members, which we're really excited about. We're starting a testing program, so we understand what's going on. Uh, Bill Renault, the town engineer, has been doing an awful lot working with uh, uh, trying to get rid of that infiltration. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, we had uh, negotiations with Cabot Cabin and Forbes. We received a $1.3 million grant to do exactly that, to uh, filter the water coming in off these, uh, um, from the street. Uh, also, in the last newsletter, you could see that we are putting a, uh, 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 Bill's team is putting together a filtration system for the, um, the uh, Vets, Vets Field area. So there's, there's a lot going on. Plus, the rain garden was just put in by Hardshore House last year. Uh, and uh, so there's a, there's a lot that we're doing, and the, the right things are being done externally, but now it's time to do the internal into the lake. And I uh, appreciate all the help you have and uh, all the support we get uh, from the Friends of Lake Quanta Pilot. Thank you very much.